One day is for dry run, one day is for restoration comedy. Restoration period is the period after the Puritan interregnum. And this is the time when <clears throat> there is the coming back of Charles II to the court uh, as king. Before that, it, the country was ruled by the Lord Protector, as you know. The Puritan Interregnum ended, and I will make you co-host. The Puritan Interregnum ended, and uh, monarchy was restored under Charles II. The Whigs and Tories all went and brought back Prince Charles. He was exiled. He was living in Holland, and uh, this man was handsome, popular, cynical, unprincipled, and he was called the Merry Monarch. Why are you raising your hands? Talk. Ma'am, I think we are live on YouTube. No, I can't change it. It's okay. So the Puritan Interregnum uh, ended with the monarchy. Coming back to power. Charles was the monarch. Because of all these reasons, he enjoyed life and he was more interested in uh, various things other than protecting the country taking care of the people. There was a war with the Dutch and uh, there was, you know, the reopening of The 17th century is a time of great unrest. And there is a lot of uh, political, religious turmoil that happened at this time. Did you understand? And uh, Charles's rule was a disaster. Uh, during this time, well, one important thing that happened was the reopening of the theaters. When the theaters reopened, there was a lot of immorality that came back to the stage. And uh, religiously, Charles brought back Church of England or uh, Anglicanism. But uh, his mother was Catholic, remember, Henry de Maria. And what happened was at this time, uh, Catholics were really powerful. And uh, slowly, slowly, Charles also turned to being a pro-Catholic and also uh, his brother converted to Catholicism. Charles also converted to Catholicism in his deathbed. So what is the re uh, result? More uh, turmoil, religious turmoil. There was the Popish plot and anti-Catholic hysteria. All these things uh, created a lot of problems. And uh, at this time, the church and the state were deeply intertwined. Uh, you know, the politi politicians were also religious men. The religious men had also become politicians. For these reasons, um, it was a time of great problems. And a lot of literature of this time, obviously, is uh, about politics. It is about religion. And it is also satire. Because this is the time when um, people were fighting with each other through literature. So if you think of literature as power, literature of power, 
restoration period is the time. Uh, and there were two political parties that emerged in Charles's time. There were the Whigs and the Tories. The Whigs were liberals. The Tories were conservatives. Did you understand? And uh, this is Charles in his uh, great attire sitting on his throne. See? The nature of painting at that time was like this. Um, there will be a lot of people or angels, etc., crowding around a person. That was a very classical style. There were many calamities, as I told you, during this time, which Charles did not really care about. Charles was uh, more into having a great time and he patronized a lot of, uh, let me say, cheap uh, writing, ordinary prose. This was the time when there was wars with the Dutch, the restoration period. Dryden also has written about it. Dryden wrote about the wars with the Dutch in two works. Did you watch the video on Dryden? Not yet. I have explained it. Uh, in two works, he talked about it. Which are the two works? One is Annus Mirabilis. About the year 1666, Dryden wrote Annus Mirabilis. There he talks about the war with the Dutch. The second is uh, of dramatic poesy. During the war with the Dutch, these characters are sitting on a barge and talking in off dramatic poesy. So that was a disastrous war. And in 1665 66, the plague broke out again. There was another attack of the plague. The plague comes in waves, like we see Corona also comes. And in 1666, there was also the Great Fire of London. Over 13,000 buildings were destroyed. It is said officially that only six people died. I don't believe that. Anyway, this great fire of London was uh, something that was written in literature a lot by different, different people. And uh, for Charles, it was something, you know, he was the like Nero. He fiddled while Rome burned. That kind of king he was, Charles was. Now, Charles II favored a policy of religious tolerance. He wanted people to follow whatever religion they wanted. He didn't really care. And he sec secretly, he favored Catholicism. He will not, he is not the kind of man who, who will go for uh, fighting over religion or anything. But secretly, he favored Catholicism because Catholicism is the luxurious, you know, brilliant religion compared to austere Protestantism and even more austere Puritanism. Now, uh, the people were not happy. So because of their pressure, Charles, even though he was secretly Catholic, he had to pass the Test Act by which all officers of the court had to take communion with the Anglican Church at least uh, once a year. So uh, all the civil and military officers had to take communion with the Anglican Church. That means they have to prove that they are Anglicans. So Charles had to sign this test act, obviously under pressure. And uh, Charles's favoring of Catholics and uh, the uh, increasing power of the Catholics was very disconcerting for the people. So there was something called Popish plot. It later turned out that it was only a rumor. There was no such thing really. But uh, it was a very big issue. What is Popish plot? Uh, the fear that Catholics are going to destroy uh, the court and uh, Charles is going to be killed, etc. Catholics are going to have, they are planning an act of terrorism. This is the idea of Popish plot. And um, it was believed that Titus Odes is the leader. Later, as I told you, the Popish plot turned out to be fictitious, but it fanned an anti Catholic hysteria throughout England. And uh, this is what led to the exclusion crisis. The exclusion crisis um, is that fighting between the Whigs and the uh, Tories over the uh, issue of uh, excluding the Catholics. Listen very carefully. There are two political parties, Whigs and Tories. Clear everyone? The Whigs are the liberals. The Tories are the conservatives. And uh, the Whigs uh, are very strict about not liking Catholicism. 
the Whigs are strict Protestants. All right. The Tories are also Protestants, but the Tories are very strict about royal blood. They don't want anybody other than royal blood, other than king uh, from, a, from the royal family to rule them. Tories. Did you understand? So when Charles did not have heirs, Charles's wife did not have children. She had miscarriages and no children, but the country was full of his illegitimate children. It was normal for the kings to have lots of mistresses. And if you look at Wikipedia, whether I keep on telling you read extra, read extra, read extra, at least one thing you should look up extra, illegitimate children of Charles. I looked up and I was shocked. There is one whole list in Wikipedia. So uh, Charles had a lot of children, but they were not legitimate. Tories will not accept them. But Whigs are okay with them. Whigs said, Duke of Monmouth, James Scott, the eldest of the illegitimate children, he should be the king, the Whigs said, because the Whigs wanted to exclude the Catholics from succession. The Whigs, under Anthony Ashley Cooper, the, Earl, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, they even tabled the exclusion bill. The exclusion bill is that bill by which Catholics will be excluded. Are you following me, everyone? Then what happens? The Tories are against it. The Tories will not accept Duke of Monmouth, James Scott, because James, Scott, James Scott is not royal blood. And there is fighting over it. Okay, in uh, England, we have a bicameral government, isn't it? Like in India, uh, Lord, uh, House of uh, Commons and House of Lords. House of Commons is low. House of Lords is higher, isn't it? Now. The exclusion bill is tabled in the House of Commons, where the Whigs are majority. What happened? The exclusion bill is passed. Clear, everybody? And then um, it goes to the House of Lords. There it is not passed because in House of Lords, it is Tories. Tories are the majority in the House of Lords because aristocrats. And meanwhile, our Anthony Ashley Cooper was arrested by Charles. So who is Charles siding with? Charles is siding with his brother. Charles is siding with James, the brother. Whereas Whigs are siding with James, the son. The illegitimate son. Did you understand everyone? So exclusion crisis means the Whigs to want to exclude the Catholics from succession. They table the exclusion bill and the Tories are against it. The Tories are supporting James is against. Wigs under run. The Earl of Shaftesbury is working against St. Charles. Did you understand? And Dryden is on which side? Dryden is on the side of the Tories. Tories. Dryden is on the side of the Tories. Did you understand? And this exclusion crisis is what he wrote his Absalom and Akitophel and the medal about. Absalom and Akitophel, medal, all these works are about exclusion crisis. Charles II, now wh whatever I told you, I'm going to read here. Okay, we will revise. You should read extra and you should watch the video. I've explained all that there. Charles II is the king. He had no legitimate heirs. His wife, Catherine, had several miscarriages. In Absalom and Akitophel, Catherine is presented as Michelle. That is the name of the wife. There are two political factions here, Whigs and Tories. The Whigs wanted to exclude James, the Catholic brother of Charles, from inheritance. The Tories are the conservatives. They supported only royal blood. They supported James as accession. Clear, everyone? The Whig party was founded by Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury. There was another Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury. Incidentally, he was a writer. He was a writer. Maybe one day they will ask uh, questions about his works also. Anyway, the Whig party founded by Anthony Ashley Cooper, the first Earl of Shaftesbury, was very powerful. This Anthony Ashley Cooper was the patron of John Locke. John Locke has written um, a response to the exclusion crisis and glorious revolution, etc. 
Uh, this uh, Earl of Shaftesbury was one of the 12 members of the parliament who traveled to the Dutch Republic to invite Charles II to return to England. He had taken an active role in bringing this Charles II to, to the throne. Now he's against Charles II because when he came to power, Charles II was a merry monarch and he started creating problems in the country. Clear everyone? So the Whigs supported the accession of James Scott, Duke of Monmouth. And James Scott was the eldest of Charles's illegitimate sons. Clear everyone? Online people? Now, I know you can't chat. This is James. Look at their wigs and robes. Yeah. They're saying James looks like Charles a little bit. Now the exclusion bill. In 1679, the Whigs under the <coughs> Earl of Shaftesbury and the Duke of Buckingham. There was one Duke of Buckingham at this time. His name is George Villiers. George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham, along with the Earl of Shaftesbury, introduced the exclusion bill in the House of Commons. The bill sought to exclude Catholics from inheriting the English throne. Catholics cannot come to throne. We don't want Catholics. The king interfered because the king wanted his brother to come to power. The king interfered, dissolved the parliament. The first thing these days kings are doing is to dissolve the parliament. Like our Charles I also who ruled for 11 years without the parliament. And he imprisoned Shaftesbury on the charge of high treason. Shaftesbury was imprisoned in 1681. And that is the uh, year in which Absalom and Akitophel was written. And soon after Absalom and Akitophel was written, Shaftesbury was imp imprisoned in 1681. Soon after that, in 1682, he wrote the medal, followed by MacFlecknow. Did you understand? Absalom and Akitophel, 1681. Shaftesbury is arrested. 1682, the medal. 1682, the, Mac, uh, the other satire, MacFlecknow. Got it, everyone? And when Shaftesbury was arrested, do you think he will remain in prison forever? He is very powerful. After some time, he is released from prison. And all the supporters of Shaftesbury are wearing a medal to uh, honor Shaftesbury. And that is what Dryden is making fun of as the medal in the poem, the medal. The medal, Absalom and Akitophel, the medal, MacFlecknow. These three are the original, the satires of Dryden. Absalom and Akitophel is not original because it is based on Old Testament. Did you understand? So, Shaftesbury was released, a medal was cast in his honor. And the bill, exclusion bill, was passed in the House of Commons, but later defeated in the House of Lords. Clear, everyone? Now, Charles ruled without the parliament for the rest of his reign. For the rest of the reign, Charles was without ruling without the parliament. Charles died of a sudden illness. At that time, everybody thought, what, was he poisoned? But he was not. On his deathbed, look at the mischievous thing he did. He converted to Catholicism because he wanted to go to the Catholic heaven, not Protestant heaven. Anyway, uh, people were angry enough. They were so furious because Catholicism is a taboo or it's a... It's a bad thing in England at that time. Charles left numerous mistresses and numerous illegitimate children, but no legitimate heirs. So this guy, James, came to power. James ruled from 1685 to 1688. Even if you don't really need to, you should still pay attention to the years. All right? The years will help you to place things in the correct way to cross correct, to understand things more organically. Okay, two years before this, that happened. After this, this happened. Like that, only you should study. Do not study chronologies, uh, but you know, separately. Somebody said, can, it, can we have a class on chronology? It broke my heart. Oh, my heart, bang, broke. Because that is not the way you should study. 
Did you understand? Chronology should, you know, it is like saying the body is working. Can we have one day when the heart also works? The body doesn't work without the heart. You can't understand history without chronology. In our school days, we were made to memorize the years and we were accused if we didn't remember, etc. That is maybe, I'm just imagining. That is why maybe we did not understand in an organic manner these years, the pressures of the exam. But remember, chronology is very easy and very interesting. And that is the circulatory system of the uh, history that we are studying. Okay, so James II ruled from 1685 to 80. Ayyoh, only three years. Only three years. Because within that three years, he had one son. And people feared this son will also grow up and become a Catholic. So immediately they threw him out of power. That is why he ruled only for three years. Did you understand? James II came to power as James II of England and Wales and Ireland and James VII of Scotland. We all know the years, the kings, etc. thoroughly now. Remember, James VII of Scotland is this James, James II. James VII, James VII of Scotland is James II of England. James VI of Scotland is James the I of England. James the first of Scotland is the Chaucerian. Remember? So James came to power as James the second of England, Wales, and Ireland, but James the seventh of Scotland. The kingdoms of Scotland and England were still not united. They were united only in the time of Queen Anne. Remember 1707, the year in which Henry Fielding was born. 1707, act of union between England and Scotland. That is when Great Britain was formed. Scotland and England united together to form Great Britain. And now it is called United Kingdom. Okay, at that time it is not called United Kingdom. Now, James was pro-French and pro-Catholic troublemaker. He was pro-French means he supported French. Which English people did not like. Why he supported French is because Scotland and French people are, are friends. Scotland, Scottish people and French people are friends. <clears throat> and he's also pro-Catholic. In 1685, James Scott, Duke of Monmouth, attempted to overthrow James. That is what is called Monmouth Rebellion. Monmouth Rebellion. And Monmouth Rebellion is the attempt to overthrow James, even before the Glorious Revolution. And James revoked the Test Act. What is Test Act, remember? Charles had signed Test Act saying everybody should take communion with the Anglican Church. That means you are all becoming Anglicans. Everybody is becoming Anglicans. And James revoked it. He threw it away. He uh, reversed it because James is pro-Catholic and he had probably designs of becoming an absolute monarch. And in 1688, at that time, he had two grown daughters, adult daughters. And these daughters were married to Protestants. And then James got a son. People are like, no way, we don't want this son to grow up and become a Catholic king here. We don't want more trouble. Better, James leaves his throne. So they went and they did not behead James or fight against James. They quietly went and brought James's own daughter and husband to come. But they were Protestants. Today, in our middle class family, husband, wife, father, mother, these are all such uh, loving relationships. In those days, uh, daughter, then uh, uncle, then nephew, then brother. These are all arch rivals and enemies. They are the people who will kill you. <laughs> Did you understand? So James saw uh, William of Orange and Mary coming and quietly left the throne, went to Scotland. Did you understand? That is called the glorious revolution because there was no bloodshed. It is bloodless revolution. 
1688, James left the throne quietly because he was afraid of being beheaded like his father. James II is the son of Charles I. Got it, everyone? And guys, this son who was born to him in 1688, he did not disappear from history. That son is there as old pretender. Why old? Because he had another son. That son had a son. That is young pretender. Why are they important? Because old pretender and young pretender led rebellions against the English monarch. Old pretender and young pretender led revolts against the English monarch. And these are called Jacobite rebellions. Did you understand? These are called Jacobite rebellions. When James left the throne, James and his followers did not keep quiet. They tried to recapture the English throne from William of Orange and Mary and also from Queen Anne. Mary's sister was Queen Anne. Got it, everyone? So, old pretender, young pretender, these are all uh, later historical figures in the Jacobite rebellions. There were two Jacobite rebellions in 1715 and 1745. Take over, James. China. China. Glorious revolution. The Protestant nobles called on, called on means visited James's Protestant son-in-law. He is also the nephew of James. Please come and rule England. William is only happy. William took his wife and Mary, Mary. Both of them, they went to England to take the throne. William's army landed from the Netherlands and James fled because James is afraid. And this is the bloodless revolution or glorious revolution. 1688, the year in which Alexander Pope is born, the year in which Bunyan died, John Bunyan, 1688. From that time onwards, for over 50 years, starting from 1689, James II and his supporters attempted to recapture the throne in what is called Jacobite uprisings, 1715, 1745. We are going over these topics again, again. Even now, I have been uh, explaining it once or twice. You should, um, like cement and concrete, you should put layers and layers and layers and layers over this. Reading on your own, revising, doing quizzes. And then you will remember forever. Otherwise, you will remember for a few days and then you'll forget. Before the exam again, you have to study. Before the next exam again, you have to study. Not like that. When you study, study so thoroughly that you never have to study the same thing again. But don't have that attitude. Even after 10 years, you will be head of the department somewhere. Even then, what is glorious revolution? Let me read. That attitude you should have. Okay? Right. And the joint monarchy. They go, William and Mary, posing for a picture. William and Mary established a joint monarchy. In 1689, they passed the Bill of Rights. Hey, it is not what you think. Bill of Rights means granting freedom of speech in Parliament, protecting the rights of the Protestants against the King, dissolving the Parliament at will and for general elections to the Parliament. It is very liberal. Bill of Rights was a very liberal uh, you know, change in politics. The king is not having absolute rights anymore. The people are having equal rights. Did you understand? Mary the second died. At that time, what, what happened? William cried. And also, <laughs> Mary the second died. <laughs> William cried and he continued to rule till 1702. Are the time of daily currents. Daily Current, in that year, March. Daily Current, the first daily newspaper came. At that time, William is ruling. And then William, kya hua usko? Died. William also died. And then Mary's sister, Queen Anne, came to the throne. And Queen Anne is the last of the stewards. 
you know that already we have been layering 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 isn't it good and charles the second and his companions had spent their time in france remember charles the second and his companions uh, were living partly in france and holland both and they brought back admiral charles the second matlab the man who came back to the throne uh, during restoration and he brought back admiration for everything french and french from that time onwards you know for many centuries french is well known for its liberal attitudes this great that led to great art and literature and philosophy etc flourishing in france and it is often uh, very close to uh, immorality there are lots of literary works where this is explored parisian dandy we say right and uh, for example the picture of dorian gray uh, things like that uh, are there at the background of literature a lot and in the ambassadors by henry james lambert strother is going to paris to bring back chad and uh, save him from immorality but um, finally he decides that chad should remain there because the life that chad is living in paris is so much greater than the life in materialistic usa so lambert strother does not bring back chad that is a story in the ambassadors by henry james right so this is uh, the high point of that french connection the restoration period brought a lot of french actresses french artists french uh, you know thinkers singers dancers painters so the compelling influence of french classicism at that time france is ruled by whom the greatest of the uh, french monarchs louis the 14th france is ruled by louis the 14th and louis the 14th ruled a long 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 time he is a man who uh, built the famous palaces of versailles and even louvre i think and uh, he um, made a rule that the barons should come and live 6 months in his palace and 6 months in their own place and uh, this Louis the 14th time was the period of brilliance and classicism and baroque classicism high point of classicism is baroque extremely brilliant uh, that is baroque and uh, this time uh, there is the flourishing of french literature and there, there there are writers like moliere who is the father of french comedy corneille and racine who are the masters of french tragedy there is boileau all of them influenced uh, dryden and the writers of the uh, neo classical england and italian influence was predominant in the elizabethan period or the renaissance period and french influence is there in the restoration period and this was the period of classicism in france what is classicism classicism is characterized by lucidity simplicity uh, vivacity even though for us romantic looks more simple than classical classicism has simple structures for example if you are writing a uh, pastoral elegy the structure is very simple first invocation of the muses then procession of learner uh, mourners then this then that like that simple classical tragedy such a simple structure five acts only three characters per scene understood so classicism in classical music i i, I was telling you about drupad the other day drupad one note not in your class one note is taken and elaborated for maybe one or two minutes only one note nothing else ah uh, like that understood classicism is not about too many things it is about clarity but vivacity and reason close attention given to form structure correctness elegance and finish classicism is about correctness that is why a lot of neoclassical writers rewrote their works many many times why is there an, an old dunciad and a new dunciad why was paradise uh, rape of the lock published in two books and then rewritten in five books 
they are rewriting it to make it more perfect. That is a very important aspect of classicism. And we have it in the restoration period. <clears throat> then we have the Baroque. The Baroque is a style in art, architecture, music, literature, high point of classicism. Baroque is dramatic. Baroque is intense. In painting, Baroque captures the physical tensions of dynamic movements. You know, the uh, characters in painting are caught in the middle of action. Their uh, posters will be like this. Whereas in Renaissance, like this. They are uh, showing the beauty and uh, secular picture of human experience in Renaissance period. And in medieval, always like this. Because they are crying about uh, the passion of Jesus Christ and the problems of religion and all that. In the medieval period, it is always without brilliance, without enjoyment. In the Renaissance period, it is always a secular enjoyment of life and existence. In the Baroque, you understand? Um, and at this time, there was also mannerism. Mannerism is related to metaphysical poetry because mannerism also takes perfect Renaissance style and distorts it. But like metaphysical poetry, take the theme of love, which is such a perfect theme, and distort it. Flea has bitten you, flea has bitten me, so let us make love, it seems. So mannerism is distortion of the ideal. Did you understand? Baroque is intensity of the ideal. Okay, Baroque captures the physical tensions of dynamic movement in painting and sculpture. And in Baroque, there will be folds of clothing, there will be curly hair. All these are expressions of intensity in painting and sculpture. And what are you getting from me? If you think you are getting knowledge from me, you are wasting your time. You are getting the method from me. Why do I know that curly hair and the folds of clothing is there in Baroque? A wonder, ponder, and prosper. <laughs> That's our tagline. You should wonder. You should look it up. You should find out things that will flesh out your ideas and knowledges. Otherwise, it is just dead matter. It is like a dead body. Whatever you mug up from me and get from me without engaging with, with it, if you know it, it is like possessing a dead body. Breathe life into it by making it yours. And it will be your best friend for the rest of your life. When you breathe life into that knowledge, it will be there for the rest of your life, taking you everywhere. You will grow and flourish because of it. Okay? Because it suddenly struck me that some, at least some people listening to me will think, okay, Baroque has curly hair. Baroque has folded clothes. <laughs> Bas, please don't be like that. So the word Baroque derives from the Portuguese word Baroco, meaning rough pearl. The English Baroque is most associated with the restoration period. And Baroque is like, um, the high point of Baroque is called Rococo. High point of Baroque is there called Rococo. Rococo, these are all prescribed in many universities. I have seen in syllabi uh, these words in reading uh, and uh, you know the general reading and even maybe prescribed texts are there. There are universities where they teach um, paintings and things along with the text. So many things are happening across the country. I have just given you a just a little bit of all those syllabi. You know, this is all very basic. Baroque high point is Rococo. Rococo art is like a very leisurely aristocratic art. In Rococo art, always aristocrats are 
lounging, lying down, uh, and listening to music, bordering on immorality. And uh, this is very similar to restoration comedy. The English Baroque was actually not very great. It was the French Baroque that existed very brilliantly. The English Baroque is associated with restoration period. In the French Baroque period, we have Charles Bernini, who just visited England. He was not an Englishman. And he made brilliant sculptures and brilliant uh, architectural uh, constructions. We already had our literary terms presentation on Baroque, I just remembered. Folds of clothing, see, too much. In Renaissance, it will not be that much. Did you understand? And then the cathedrals, Baroque cathedrals are very common. Intricately decorated uh, walls and ceilings. Now, uh, let me just introduce restoration prose. The age witnessed the birth of modern prose. I hope everybody is paying attention. Because we are doing YouTube live, I'm not uh, stopping to uh, talk to you. I hope everybody in YouTube is also understanding and following and enjoying what we are doing here. This is our offline and online combined class. Accidentally, I went online live, I mean, um, but it is Felix Kulpa because we are sharing this class with all of you. Now, restoration pros. The age witnessed the birth of modern prose. Modern prose, how is it different from pre-modern prose? Modern prose is simple, direct, lucid. Whereas in the 17th century, did you read the encyclopedias? You must have. 17th century prose is characterized by copia. What is copia? Abundance. You didn't read? Copia, you, did you read? Copia is abundance, so much brilliantly spoken about philosophy, religion, etc. And that is not the modern style. Modern style is speak briefly, speak succinctly, lucidly. You understand? And not aphoristically, that is too much, but in between. Interesting, simple, lucid prose. Dryden was definitely uh, a very important figure in the Gen in the in the, the genesis or origin of modern prose and Dryden's prose was all critical prose. Dry Dryden wrote a lot of critical essays, epilogues, most importantly of dramatic poesy and preface to the fables. But there is also essay on satire, essay on heroic play, etc. There were many women writers at this time. Women writers uh, like Margaret Cavendish, Afra Ben. You also know Eliza Hayward, Della Riviere Manley. So many women writers. Margaret Cavendish wrote a book compared to Bill Bacon's New Atlantis. It is called uh, The Blazing World. Margaret Cavendish wrote The Blazing World. That is compared to New Atlantis. There are so many books like this, which you should remember later when I teach you. Who wrote Crystal World, Drowned Worlds. Do you remember it is J.G. Ballard? Great world, I think, David Malouf. Some, something is there, David Malouf. Blazing World is by Margaret Cavendish. Afra Ben is a woman writer. She is the first professional woman writer in England. And everybody knows she wrote Urunoko, but she wrote a lot of plays also. And uh, she uh, also wrote letters from a nobleman to his sister. And Afro Ben was a spy. She had an adventurous life. Wow, what a woman. Urunoko or the royal slave. That is the full title. We will come to Afro Ben later. Introduction to restoration drama. Development of restoration drama illustrated the rise and decline of an artificial pseudo courtly ideal in England. Restoration drama is aristocratic. Restoration drama, listen everybody, restoration drama is aristocratic because in the restoration period, there are indoor theaters. Indoor theater. 
It is not an open theater like Elizabethan period. Paying attention. And in the restoration period, you have to pay a lot of money in order to watch a play. So, because it is not open for everyone, just a few people can sit. So, uh, only the rich pe people could afford to go to the theater. Naturally, restoration theater began to show only aristocracy on stage. Stories are al almost always about the aristocracy or the aspiring middle class. That means the people just below the aristocracy. And uh, they made fun of their own culture. They satirized their own culture. And they showed a lot of immorality and luxuriousness on stage. That is called restoration comedy and heroic drama. The two genres of drama in the restoration period have given here heroic drama and comedy of manners. Comedy of manners in the restoration period is called co restoration comedy. That's the high point of comedy of manners. Comedy of manners is a big genre. From the time of Menander, plotters and taverns. Remember, we talked about Menander, Greek, new comedy. Then plotters and taverns. Remember, in Roman times, all of them were precursors of comedy of manners. Comedy of manners is upper class characters, a great life, like drawing room comedies, rather superficial. You know, like. Uh, uh, so, uh, I don't. I don't actually know for sh for correctly, but there are uh, which channel I don't know in TV Hindi serials, Z TV. Where do you find it? Uh, where uh, all the serials are about upper class brilliant people. Star. Ah, I don't watch any of those channels ever, so I don't know. Uh, those are all comedies of manners. Always, every serial is about brilliant, uh, rich people only. That is comedy of manners. So um, the restoration period had comedy of manners and heroic drama. The history play disappeared. I was saying uh, restoration comedy is aristocratic. Please pay attention. Restoration comedy is aristocratic. On stage, they showed brilliant people, comedy of manners only. And uh, their values were masculine. That is why heroic drama, masculine values, hero, love and duty. Love and duty. The warriors are either in love or they are you know, fighting for their country and they are torn between the two. Like in the case of Antony in All for Love. Dryden's All for Love. Are you paying attention? Did you understand? So, restoration drama is very aristocratic. It is very uh, brilliant drama and it has masculine values. Why I am saying this is because later in the 18th century, there was a reaction against restoration comedy when especially the Licensing Act of 1737 came. The Licensing Act put an end to restoration comedy. And what happened? Sentimental comedies and sentimental tragedies came into being. Sentimental comedy and sentimental tragedy came into being. Sentimental comedy is a middle class reaction against the restoration comedies. They are middle class and they are feminized. 18th century revolted against the brilliant masculine upper class attitudes of the restoration period. That is why we have a feminized mock epic in Rape of the Lock. Did you understand? So, uh, restoration period is brilliant, upper class and masculine. Whereas the middle, uh, the uh, 18th century Augustan period gave importance to middle class and feminized. That is why in the 18th century we have Pamela, we have Clarissa, we have a feminized uh, Charles Grandison. Charles Grandison is perfect like a woman. You understand? I mean, I'm using a sexist expression, but women should be perfect. Men can be rakes in that sense. So restoration drama, right now itself, you should understand how it is different from Augustan drama. So restoration drama is of two kinds, heroic drama and comedy of manners. Clear, everyone? The hero history play disappeared at this time. And the national consciousness, everybody's drama, that also disappeared.
restoration theater dekho the theater and audience of the restoration period were very different from those of the elizabethan era in the restoration period there were indoor theaters indoor listen everybody elizabeth i have taught you i have told you this when i taught you elizabethan theater also i think elizabethan theater was open theater there is no roof on in uh, on top of the theater on top of the stage roof is there only in the gallery and the stage is open 40 feet wide 27 feet projection into the pit that's a big stage there are there can be a lot of people on stage even the queen is sitting there on stage and you can show wars you can so show storms you can show big big outdoor scenes in elizabethan drama but if you try doing all these things in restoration drama it will be hilarious because it uh, restoration theater is like looking through a frame like this into inside a room that kind of feeling it is because there is a stage and in or in front of the stage there is a frame it is the picture frame stage so you are looking at the stage through the frame you feel like you are looking inside a room you are looking into a painting it's like a moving painting restoration drama that was a very important connection they try to emulate the values of painting that is why there were there are such luxurious dressing it was like a rococo painting in action are you following me rococo painting in action so we have indoor theaters picture frame stage actresses taking female parts for the first time before that young boys took female parts and there was actually abused also there was a lot of immorality related to that that is why puritans hated it now actresses are taking female parts who are the earliest actresses in england all those things are very very important you have to search and read and uh, remember okay and uh, what, what are their acting troops what kind of drama was it what kind of theater was it etc are all very important because in our classrooms in ma ba we usually traditionally paid attention only to drama as text but drama as performance is equally important nowadays a lot of syllabi includes that also but not maybe all of your syllabi had it so remember that and for the first time on restoration stage there is moving scenery and also there is artificial lighting the stage because of all this was dominated by spectacle you can show spectacular scenes on stage which is actually anti classical there are many anti classical elements in restoration drama and theater which is why dryden had to talk about which is better french or english because the french are classical english are anti classical clear and here in the restoration theater the audience is more restricted geographically and socially audience is restricted everybody like in the elizabethan stage uh, elizabethan theater everybody in the society could not attend drama naturally restoration comedies uh, showed the brilliant uh, you know uh, naughty upper class characters and made fun of the lower class citizens did you understand so uh, for the restoration commoners for the common people of the restoration period drama meant immoral upper class immorality that is what drama meant now look at a picture frame stage we are used to it because many of our auditoriums will have such stages this is the picture frame and it is a very unusual thing for english people at that time because they are used to just open theaters restoration drama was influenced by ben johnson himself even though ben johnson wrote comedy of humors comedy of humors was an influence on comedy of manners restoration writers dandified johnson's moral comedies johnson uh, was a very moralistic classical writer johnson's stories and characters are taken and changed into such immoral dandified characters in restoration drama and jacobian writers were still popular in the restoration period 
Bowman and Fletcher, for example. That is why Dryden and uh, uh, you, you know Dryden and uh, Pope also mentions um, Bowman and Fletcher. I'm, I'm, I might be wrong. Um, I have a feeling. He talks about Fletcher. Dryden, definitely. There is also the influence of French writers like Corneille, Moliere and Racine. I already told you Corneille is the father of French comedy. Racine and Cor uh, not Corneille, Moliere is the father of French comedy. Cor Racine and Corneille are fathers of French tragedy. Moliere, Jean -Bap Baptiste Poquillin, that is his real name. Moliere is the pen name. Molia Jean J E N Jean Baptist B A P T I S T E P O Q U E L I N. Ah, uh, he wrote comedies, Le Misanthrope, The Misanthrope, The Miser, Tartuffe, uh, School of Wives, very famous plays of Molia. We should not get P uh, M A in English without knowing European literature. Where you know. There is such a gap if you do not know European literature because almost everything in English literature is integrally connected to European literature. And we don't know it, let alone enough. We don't know it at all. We don't even know names properly. Throw your MA, literature, MA degree away. You don't deserve it unless you read on this and find out more. Study European literature. That is the foundation of British literature. So many writers are connected with the European writers. Okay. Restoration period, it is impossible to understand without uh, Moliere, for example. Moliere was there in all the restoration comedies. Comedies of Moliere were translated and adapted. Restoration writers admired and imitated French wit. And the plays of the Spanish writer Calderon were also very popular at this time. So I hope you will read extra and uh, I will also give you uh, material uh, based on that. Now we are coming to the writers. I will stop the live stream and uh, I hope you enjoyed. Don't go away, students.